Okay, maybe we can start. Uh, I'm just, so I don't understand, maybe uh, people uh, from, from Zoom uh, are viewing, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, we see you. What? Yeah, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, we see. You see us and, uh, and let's yeah. see. And the slides are pinned, right? No, we don't so see, do you slides. see the slides. We don't see the slides, but we yeah. saw them before. Okay, so let's see if. Uh, yeah. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Okay, and now maybe yeah. Okay, they can be pinned. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. So, welcome everyone to the. To this uh, special uh, GSSI mathematics colloquium, it's uh, it's really a pleasure, let's say, to 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 have um, finally uh, a colloquium in presence, and uh, moreover, it's a let's say it's a pleasure to to introduce uh, the speaker and the topic uh, of today. So the speaker is uh, Roberto Gezzicco, he's, uh, he's a professor at, uh, here at uh, GSSI, he's also a professor at uh, Tor Vergata, University of Rome. Uh, he's also appointed uh, part-time as a professor at the University of Twente yes. in, uh, in the Netherlands. And um, so he's, uh, well, I mean, he's a specialist in uh, turbulence and uh, cardiovascular flows, uh, he did uh, um, important uh, contributions um, uh, in these subjects. And uh, what, what else can I say? Uh, it's, uh, it's enough. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, well, let's say, he's the editor uh, in the Journal of uh, Fluid Mechanics and, um, and fellow of the American Physical Society, the European uh, Society of Mechanics, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure for, for us uh, to, to, to host him, even if it's a GSSI, let's say it was him here at the, um, at the, at the, at the colloquia. And uh, so he will talk about uh, extended lifetime of uh, respiratory droplets okay. and its implication on airborne disease transmission. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, coming here. It is a pleasure and a little bit of emotion uh, staying again in contact, in physical contact uh, uh, with people. And uh, uh, the topic of the, today's talk uh, is uh, somehow related to how dangerous is uh, uh, staying close together uh, before uh, in the open air and then if time allows uh, also in closed uh, environments. So this is a, a, a big collaboration you can see from the uh, list of names uh, and from the uh, uh, faces. So there are many uh, students and uh, two students are binded by the most senior uh, say advisors. So uh, Detlef Lose uh, on the uh, left and myself uh, on, the, on the right. So first of all, uh, uh, the motivation. Why uh, do we want to study this, uh, 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 this topic? Uh, this topic has, be, uh, has clearly been triggered by the uh, nowadays uh, pandemic. And you might have seen that uh, every government, every institution has, uh, has issued uh, some uh, rules uh, and uh, regulations uh, and, uh, uh, and social distancing, uh, wearing masks. Uh, so uh, initially the question was very simple. So how effective and how rational are these uh, uh, regulations? So do we really need to wear face masks? Uh, uh, is it really necessary staying uh, two meters far apart? Or is it just something that we do by, by tradition? And so we tried to figure out whether we could 
somehow uh, study using our uh, fluid mechanics uh, uh, competencies uh, uh, this uh, uh, problem. So the idea uh, was to, uh, well, let's see if I can get, okay. So first of all, uh, as uh, uh, any serious uh, scientist, when starting to, uh, to face a new problem, starts to do some uh, literature research. And uh, uh, to our surprise, we uh, realized that it is an old problem. And in fact, you might have uh, uh, seen, you, you might have got to know that uh, there has already been a, a worldwide pandemic. It was the Spanish flu uh, in 1919. And then there was a paper in Science, uh, the uh, Soper uh, published uh, uh, this paper. And then he, he issued uh, a number of uh, empirical rules. So you might see that uh, uh, if you read through the lines, it seems a paper published uh, yesterday because uh, they see essentially uh, what we are hearing every day uh, nowadays. So avoid uh, needless crowding. Uh, uh, suspects should wear masks and uh, try to keep separated uh, infectious uh, people with uh, uh, healthy ones and so on. And then uh, history repeats uh, uh, itself and so after a century there was another paper in uh, science um, more or less saying the same things so here I've made uh, uh, a sort of summary let's see if I can get it seems stuck okay so you can see that uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, the same things uh, are, are, are repeated so our idea was uh, uh, can we uh, check using uh, our knowledge whether or not these uh, uh, rules are, uh, are justified. And then what we did was to uh, essentially ask ourselves two, uh, two questions. So why there is danger uh, in the air? For how long? And uh, uh, one of the statements of the most recent paper is that uh, these two meters distancing among people is likely not to be uh, enough, not to be sufficient. So uh, our question was, is it always so? Is it uh, only in some uh, conditions? And this is how we got uh, uh, into the problem. So the reason why uh, there is danger in the air, it is clear uh, looking at this picture. So you can see that when uh, coughing or sneezing, but uh, even when talking, singing, uh, or uh, arguing with other people, uh, we diffuse, we spread uh, uh, a lot of uh, droplets. Now, these droplets uh, have different size. There are the biggest ones uh, essentially are uh, sort of bullets in, uh, in quote. So they, uh, once they are spit, uh, they uh, attain a parabolic uh, trajectory and they fall to the ground. But then together with these uh, ballistic uh, uh, droplets, there are much tiner ones. And they have a much more complex dynamics because they are convected by uh, uh, turbulence. They interact each other and they interact not only mechanically, but also thermodynamically because there is a, a moist in the air, there is temperature difference. And then all the uh, dynamics becomes uh, incredibly uh, involved. So uh, this is just uh, another video that uh, I have got uh, from, uh, from a friend. And you see that even when uh, talking, you can uh, uh, spread uh, uh, droplets. Okay, so this is a picture I got uh, from uh, uh, the newspaper from Republica uh, yesterday. And there is this picture uh, which warns to stay two meters far apart uh, uh, each other. This is in, uh, in London. And so uh, this comes from this uh, six feet rule. So uh, something we uh, uh, realized is, the, is that uh, this six feet rule distancing comes from a quite old uh, uh, theory that now I will try to, uh, to summarize in, uh, in a little bit. So the idea from this uh, uh, Wells uh, in 1934 is that uh, a droplet evolves according to two competing uh, mechanisms. So one is uh, the falling of the droplet. So you have a sphere this sphere starts falling, but uh, almost immediately there is a balance between uh, gravity and uh, uh, aerodynamic drag. So it reaches uh, a terminal velocity. 
And this terminal velocity is proportional uh, uh, to the area, okay? To some, uh, uh, there is some uh, uh, geometrical coefficient, but uh, uh, it scales uh, uh, as the area. But then uh, there is also the evaporation of this droplet. The evaporation of this droplet, uh, and there is a, a seminal paper by uh, Langmuir in 1918, and this tells that the rate of uh, uh, reduction of a droplet is constant. So the area shrinks at a constant rate. Now, if you do a little bit of arithmetics and you put together uh, all, the, all the arguments, you end up with two uh, very simple uh, scaling laws. So this scaling laws tells you that the height a droplet can travel uh, before evaporating goes uh, like the diameter to the power four and the rate of shrinkage of this uh, uh, diameter is uh, like t to the power one half, or in other words, uh, d squared uh, uh, decreases linearly in time, and this is known uh, as the uh, d2 law for the uh, evaporation of droplets. Now, what happens is that the big droplets fall to the ground before they uh, can uh, uh, propagate, while light droplets uh, evaporate before they reach the ground. And so, the worst that can happen is in between because uh, the droplet uh, is uh, big enough not to evaporate, but not too big uh, to fall immediately to the ground. And then if you uh, put uh, together the numbers, you end up with this uh, uh, six feet. And this is uh, uh, summarized by this graph. So I just dumped uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, graph, the picture from, uh, uh, from the paper. And so you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, the edge between the red line and the black area is this uh, six feet that uh, uh, droplets can, uh, can travel. So the most important uh, thing to, uh, uh, to, uh, to realize is that uh, below the red line, no droplets can exist because they just evaporate before reaching uh, the ground. Now, if you make uh, uh, the theory a bit more complex, so here there are some uh, indications on the picture, you can also account for the humidity of the air. Because in fact, what happens is that uh, the effective diffusion of vapor while the droplet uh, uh, evaporates depends also on the humidity difference between the droplet and the ambient fluid. But still, uh, the picture is the same and you don't change much. So uh, this is somehow expected that in dry air, a droplet survives uh, less. In humid hair, it survives uh, longer times. Okay, what about uh, the real picture? So the real picture is uh, much more complex because uh, uh, when we uh, exhale our breath, this breath has a different temperature with respect to the ambient air. It has a different humidity content. Our breath uh, is a uh, by definition, 100% uh, uh, relative humidity. And then uh, there is a, a thermodynamic interaction between the ambient at some temperature and our breath at a different temperature between our relative humidity, 100%, and the ambient relative humidity. And on top of this, there is momentum because when we uh, cough or sneeze, uh, we uh, produce a jet and there is mixing mechanical steering and turbulence. So all this uh, has an interplay together, and this is far too complex uh, uh, to work out uh, in analytical theory. Uh, so uh, since I'm an engineer, I'm a fluid dynamicist, uh, uh, it comes somehow uh, without saying that it, this is a, a sort of dream problem to, uh, to use uh, our brute force numerical simulation. So what do I mean by brute force? We take the equations, uh, we discretize them and we integrate by some numerical method and we see what, uh, uh, what we can get. Okay, uh, there are of course some uh, uh, previous studies uh, and uh, if you are interested in uh, this, uh, uh, this topic, uh, uh, I invite you to consult uh, these papers by uh, Emmanuel Villermo. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he, he has studied experimentally and theoretically a vapor field evolving in a dense spray of droplets. And so he also came to a similar conclusion that uh, the dynamics of uh, isolated droplets uh, has to do with the surrounding uh, humidity. 
Okay. Now, I said that uh, we would like to simulate this problem, but uh, let's do some math and uh, let's try to figure out what do we need to uh, simulate such a problem. So we see that uh, uh, it is quite tough. And, and this is what makes it uh, beautiful because it is very uh, rich in, uh, in physics and dynamics. So first of all, we have uh, flow motion. So we need uh, Navier-Stokes equations to, uh, to simulate or to, uh, to model the motion of the fluid. But then we have uh, scalar fields. So temperature fields, humidity fields, and then uh, we must couple with the Navier-Stokes equations also scalar concentration uh, equations, okay? Then we have uh, droplets, and these droplets uh, uh, are sort of Lagrangian markers. So what, what do I mean by Lagrangian? We need to track each individual droplet uh, along its trajectory. Now, this droplet is not a passive marker or just uh, a stone because it has some dynamics. So the dynamics uh, is the second Newton's law of motion for the uh, trajectory. But then there is a heat exchange with the surrounding fluid. There is humidity exchange and there is also phase change because the droplet can evaporate or can condensate the external humidity on uh, uh, the droplet itself. So uh, each droplet can uh, act uh, as a nucleus, as a condensation nucleus to, uh, to grow in size. Good. And then of course we need to know uh, representative parameters. So how many droplets do we exhale uh, during a cough? Which size? Uh, what is uh, uh, the mean temperature? What is the mean momentum? So this has implied uh, a lot of uh, research in the literature. And then of course, uh, all this has to uh, fit uh, into some uh, uh, tractable uh, uh, numerical method. And this implies uh, high performance computing, uh, uh, parallel computations. So uh, I won't go on uh, all these uh, uh, details, but of course, if you think it would be interesting, just let me know. I would be more than glad uh, uh, discussing with you. Okay, so uh, some uh, uh, equations. So this is for the uh, Eulerian phases. So there is uh, mass, momentum, uh, temperature, and uh, vapor. And by the way, this is something we are quite uh, proud of. So this code is fully parallelized, uh, is written in Fortran, and we have uh, open sourced it uh, uh, to the community. So if you feel you could be interested, just go on the uh, link on the website and feel free to download and, and use it. Okay, so this is for the Eulerian part. But of course, we have also a Lagrangian part. So what is this uh, Lagrangian part? The first equation is just the dynamics of the droplet. So F equal MA written for each individual droplet. And of course, there are forces. And these forces are gravity, uh, there is drag, uh, there is added mass. There are many others. Uh, there is the lift force, the basse force, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, since uh, uh, mucus, uh, and solid droplets are much denser than the ambient air, some of those terms uh, uh, can be dropped. Okay, but the equation, uh, there is a, a max really equation uh, involves uh, uh, some 10 terms uh, on the uh, right hand side. But this is not enough because then uh, we must couple the temperature and then we have uh, the heat equation for each individual droplet. And then we have the evaporation and this is essentially uh, energy balance uh, for a sphere, and this sphere can change temperature, but can also evaporate or condensate. So you work out a little bit of uh, uh, arithmetics, and you end up with an equation for the radius of each sphere in time. And then, uh, of course, it is uh, uh, impossible, it is irrealistic, uh, the idea of modeling, uh, of capturing uh, by numerical simulation the thin boundary layer around each droplet. And then what we do, we use uh, uh, a couple of correlations for the heat exchange uh, uh, coefficient and for the mass transfer coefficient. Anyway, these are quite well-known uh, correlations. And so eventually, you uh, can fit everything together. What is important to realize is that uh, things are two-way coupled. So 
a droplet moving uh, in the air or in, in the gas drags the gas itself because of uh, aerodynamic uh, friction and then transfers momentum. And then temperature is transferred. So everything is uh, two-way coupled uh, uh, between uh, Eulerian and uh, Lagrangian uh, phases. Uh, well, just a, a, a few number. Uh, so each simulation has involved some uh, uh, 400 million uh, uh, grid points because uh, those of you who have attended the class of uh, continuum mechanics might recall that the turbulence uh, involves uh, energy cascade and uh, energy cascade generates small scales and these small, small scales needs to be, uh, need to be captured by, by the grid. So uh, at this Reynolds number, uh, no less than 400 million grid points are necessary and this uh, calls for a couple of weeks uh, of uh, uh, waiting time for each simulation. Okay, now uh, what else? Uh, realistic parameters. So when we uh, cough, temperature uh, of uh, uh, the uh, exhaled uh, air is of the order of 35, uh, 34 degrees and the relative humidity is 100%. So uh, what is important is that uh, air is uh, warmer uh, and it is a little bit denser because about uh, in between 3.5 and 4% of what we exhale is CO2. And CO2 is uh, uh, a bit heavier than, uh, uh, than hair. Now, uh, although uh, it is not relevant, uh, this, uh, uh, this temperature difference for momentum, we have put into the equations, just because it is extremely easy. But just to, uh, to convince you that uh, buoyancy in this case is not uh, uh, crucial, we have computed the, the uh, Richardson number. Now this is a non-dimensional uh, measure of uh, uh, how buoyancy uh, is relevant with respect to momentum. And you can see that uh, it is of the order 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. So this, this means that when we cough, our jet essentially goes dry. So it doesn't bend because of buoyancy or doesn't sink because uh, it is uh, heavier than the ambient fluid. Okay, this, this was the uh, toughest part to, uh, to figure out. So when we cough, how many droplets and which size? And then uh, if you go through the literature, you see that there is uh, a paper of uh, 146 or 49, uh, which gives you a distribution of the droplets. Now, uh, the experimental data are the red triangles and the uh, blue circles are uh, our data. So you might see that we had to, uh, to chop somehow this distribution to droplets of the order of uh, 10 microns in diameter. The reason is that the smaller is the droplet, the stiffer is the integration of its uh, trajectory. But fortunately, uh, very tiny droplets uh, just follow the uh, fluid as passive tracer. The reason being that the Stokes number, which is reported in this uh, slide, uh, is, very, is, is very small, okay? So, uh, I've also reported the graph with the various uh, Stokes number compared to the Reynolds number. So all the green region is uh, when droplets become uh, passive tracers. So for passive tracers, we don't need the uh, Lagrangian tracking uh, of the particles, okay? And so we have chopped uh, this, uh, uh, this distribution. And then, uh, uh, well, we can start looking at the, the results, okay? So, here there is uh, an animation. You might see from the color bars uh, uh, below that there are uh, uh, three uh, different uh, uh, variables uh, and we have tried to report uh, all three of them uh, uh, within a single uh, uh, animation. So now enjoy the movie uh, for a few seconds. So you can immediately see that there are uh, uh, the reddish uh, uh, droplets that indeed behave uh, as bullets and from the color bar below, you see that these are the, the biggest. And then there are the uh, greenish droplets, which instead do not fall at all. They are just convected by the turbulent uh, jet in the, uh, in the ambient. Uh, so something which is relevant uh, to see, uh, this is a, a snapshot of the humidity field. And now you can see that although the ambient, uh, 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 the ambient air has a humidity of 
the 100, sorry, of 90%, the 100% humidity of the uh, exhaled uh, cough stays quite coherent uh, for a while, but there is even more. If you look uh, at the uh, color bar, uh, well, maybe it is not fully evident here, but close to the mouth, there are regions whose uh, uh, relative humidity exceeds 100%. So why is it so? Well, the point is that relative humidity depends on temperature. So if we exhale 100% breath at 34 degrees, it contains more water, more vapor than is allowed at the ambient temperature outside. And so it becomes a super saturated gas. And this has a consequence for droplets. So uh, this is something different. Let's see how droplets uh, uh, travel. And now we have tracked uh, uh, each trajectory. So you can see that there are the biggest who essentially follow a, a parabolic trajectory. Then there are uh, the, the green ones who are intermediate. So they travel until the, uh, uh, the drug stops them. And then there are uh, the, the lightest ones. And those just keep moving uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the turbulent path, okay? Uh, so one result is that uh, the evaporation is very much delayed, and we will see it later. The reason being that a droplet who evolves uh, within the, the path, the turbulent path, is shielded by the humidity around. So the uh, naive and simplistic picture of wells applies, assuming that the droplet always evaporates in a sort of dry air of constant humidity air outside. But this is not the case because uh, small droplets are always shielded, protected by the humidity of the path. And so they move in a saturated environment. So they just do not, do not evaporate because thermodynamics does not allow. And so if they can survive for longer times without falling to the ground because they are sustained by turbulence and they do not evaporate because local humidity keeps them alive, then they can travel for meters without evaporating. And this is how the spreading mechanism uh, works. Now, the, uh, the bad part of this uh, mechanism is that uh, you cannot define just a single parameter or a single distance because it depends on the ambient humidity, on the ambient temperature, and uh, we, we will see also uh, whether you have a single cough or multiple coughs, okay? So a sort of a, a crisis. So what is the influence of the uh, uh, relative humidity uh, of the ambient? Well, a, a couple of pictures uh, here. So this is uh, how a droplet, uh, how long a droplet survives compared to the well's uh, uh, time scale. So if these symbols were all uh, at one, it meant that the simple wells theory applied uh, perfectly. So you can see that it holds for very big droplets. So the tails of these curves uh, just stays uh, flat uh, around one. And of course, this is true because uh, uh, bullets just fall to the ground and evaporation uh, doesn't play any role for these uh, dynamics. But tiny droplets behave completely differently. So you can see the most worrisome droplets are those around 10 microns. Because they do not evaporate, being shielded by the ambient, temper, uh, ambient humidity, and do not fall because they are sustained by turbulence. And so the only factor determining uh, uh, their life is the ambient uh, humidity. The, long, the, the higher is the ambient humidity, the longer they can survive. And so you can see that uh, for an ambient humidity of 50%, uh, the lifetime uh, is uh, around 35 times more than uh, wells uh, uh, assumed. But if you rise this humidity to 90%, then uh, the extended lifetime goes to 120 times. So the picture, the simple picture on which uh, the six feet rule uh, uh, is based uh, is clearly uh, completely off the, uh, the real uh, uh, dynamics. And you can see here, this somehow summarizes the ratio of the lifetimes uh, uh, for different droplets uh, 
compared to the ambient uh, uh, humidity. Now, just to uh, keep you uh, with a connection to reality, keep in mind that uh, each symbol uh, plotted on this, uh, uh, on this graph, each bullet, is a three-dimensional simulation which ran uh, for uh, uh, a couple of weeks uh, on uh, thousands of processors. So this is how, how expensive uh, is numerical simulation uh, of uh, multi-phase turbulence. Okay, well, this we have already uh, discussed. And uh, somehow this is just a, a reinforcement of what uh, we have been uh, uh, saying. E essentially what happens here, uh, since one of the beauties of numerical simulation is that you have uh, attend all the flow, all the field, three-dimensional, unsteady, point by point, and then you can figure out uh, uh, every analysis you, uh, you want to do. So one of the things that uh, we uh, decided is to look at the relative humidity surrounding each droplet, just to check whether this idea of the shielded uh, uh, droplet uh, is true or not. Now, of course, uh, droplets are distributed in space. So those uh, at the edge of the turbulent path essentially experience the humidity of the ambient, but those well within the, uh, the core of the, of the jet, of the path, uh, they are protected. And then they have a humidity which is very high. Now, what is important here is that uh, you can see that when you have the ambient humidity of 50%, so the uh, plot uh, on the left, the average humidity of the uh, droplets is always above. And the reason is that uh, for small droplets, uh, it is because uh, uh, the uh, exhaled uh, breath uh, is uh, super saturated. For the big droplets, is because they are always surrounded by evaporating uh, liquid, which anyway, since they are massive, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, it, this evaporation is not enough to, uh, to extinguish uh, uh, them. And uh, similar dynamics occurs for uh, uh, ambient humidity at 90%. Uh, well, here there is a, a little bit of uh, uh, deeper analysis, but uh, uh, in words, uh, uh, I've already explained. Okay, this is also uh, another measure of uh, how different, uh, uh, how, well, I would say wrong, but I don't want to be offensive. Of course, Wells figured out his brilliant theory in uh, 1934, so it is remarkable. Uh, however, if wells were right, the ratio between uh, the rate of change uh, of surface droplet and uh, the wells rate of change would be one, okay? And so we see that this ratio is only once, one uh, and by accident. So smaller droplets evaporate uh, at, a, at a much slower uh, rate, but uh, uh, big droplets do, uh, do faster because there is dynamics. Because, of course, while a droplet falls, it's in its wake, it sheds uh, uh, the evaporated fluid, and so it, the big droplets always face uh, sort of dry air uh, around. Okay. Uh, now, this is also another relevant uh, uh, summary. So, on the uh, left, uh, I've reported the original Wells diagram rotated, tilted by 90 degrees. So if wells were right, below the red curve, nothing should exist. And on the right, we have our, uh, our own simulations. And so you can see that not, not only most of the uh, dynamics occurs uh, uh, below, but the, even if you consider the humidity in a jet, and this is the most recent uh, uh, curve, the one by Xie uh, et al. of 2007, still things do not, uh, uh, do not match. Why? The reason is that uh, in this uh, uh, more recent uh, analysis, uh, the interplay between uh, the humidity of the droplet and the humidity of the jet, uh, in that case, it was not accounted. It was uh, considered a humid jet in uh, uh, and, and a droplet evolving in a frozen field. So somehow it was similar to the analysis of wells with different humidity uh, values. Okay. Now the role of temperature, and now I can speed up, of course, because uh, now we have got familiar with the uh, flow physics. 
So again, we have a, a, a movie uh, which you should realize, but now look at the field in background. So this is what happens when the ambient uh, temperature is uh, 30 degrees. So you can see that uh, uh, the humidity behind uh, uh, is very pale and very, uh, and very low. The reason is that uh, hot air can host, can absorb a lot of humidity. So our 100% at 34 degrees makes very little difference with the ambient uh, uh, temperature. Look at how different is the dynamics if we have 10 degrees. So you can see that uh, the ambient uh, temperature below is much uh, uh, more intense. And if you look uh, at the uh, color bars, you would see that the maximum is not 100%, but is 110. And this is what uh, uh, I've told you before. Our exhaled breath uh, is super saturated. So this makes uh, uh, a very different mechanism. So up to now, we have only focused on the idea that a droplet does not shrink as fast as Wells predicted. But now, if you have a super saturated path, there is also another factor that we haven't considered uh, yet. And, uh, well, here there are some uh, comments. So what is this factor? So you might say, uh, this is quite uh, a, a tiny detail to, uh, to, to catch. The black line is the initial distribution of droplets, okay? And then there are the uh, distribution of droplets uh, at the same time for different ambient temperature. So you might notice that uh, the droplets in between, uh, uh, say, up to 30 microns are slightly above uh, the initial distribution uh, if the ambient temperature is low enough. So this is a sort of, uh, this seems a sort of numerical mistake. So whenever you exceed your initial conditions, uh, you should always get uh, a little bit worried. Uh, so how comes that you have uh, more droplets, uh, 10 microns in diameter than you have put initially? Uh, however, there is a physical explanation for this. So let's focus on these uh, 15 microns uh, uh, droplets. So let's see what happens. This is, uh, as time goes, the ratio of uh, the actual diameter with the initial diameter. So you can see that there is a, a steady decrease, of course, with some scatter because uh, uh, it is in a turbulent environment. But this is what happens at 10 degrees. So you see there is an initial increase and then a decrease. So how is it possible? Well, what is going on? Well, there is a growth, and this growth we, uh, we know, we understand. So these droplets are in a super saturated environment, so they act as a condensation nucleus. So you have water in a super saturated environment, and then water can condensate, vapor can condensate on the droplet. And, uh, well, this is... Uh, uh, Another way to see it, so we are looking at the relative humidity in the area surrounding the droplet, depending on the ambient temperature. And so you see that when the ambient is at 10 degrees, the relative humidity is uh, up to 120% of what is allowed. And then vapor has no choice but condensate on, to on, the, on the surface of the droplet. And we have also got uh, additional indicators of uh, of this behavior, uh, well, of course we know. We all know that when we breathe in cold environments, uh, then uh, our breath becomes foggy. The reason is that uh, the excess humidity immediately condensates into, uh, into droplets. And uh, uh, this is also something that uh, we can uh, uh, catch. So this is the ratio of the droplet temperature with respect to the initial value. And so the temperature increases. And this is the condensation latent heat, okay? So all uh, uh, indicators concur to, uh, uh, to justify this, uh, uh, this picture. Well, these are other uh, analysis, but uh, I, won't, uh, uh, I won't bother you with uh, uh, countless uh, uh, evidence of the same physical mechanism. 
And now, since we have run, uh, uh, as I said, the 12 different cases, we could make uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, a sort of phase space of what happens. So you see that depending on the ambient humidity and depending on the ambient uh, uh, temperature, you can get uh, in, uh, into regions in which uh, the initial droplets uh, grow rather than shrinking. And this further uh, enhances the, uh, the life timing. Uh, so I can come to some uh, uh, conclusions, uh, which you can just read. And in case uh, you are interested in, uh, uh, in the uh, literature, you can refer to the uh, uh, papers below. Of course, uh, uh, there are many nice results, but there are also many uh, questions. So this is an uh, ongoing uh, uh, project. So there are several open issues. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, even if we know what is the fate of a, tra of, a, of a droplet, what happens to viruses? So after all, a virus is nothing but uh, an, an organic molecule. So even if uh, a droplet uh, uh, completely dries out, what happens to the uh, virus itself? Can it act uh, as a nucleus for new condensation, so to generate a new droplet? Is it still... Uh, uh, infectious uh, or, or not, this is actually something we, uh, we don't know. And, uh, uh, well, another point uh, is that uh, when we breathe, we exhale uh, saliva, and saliva uh, is, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a suspension uh, of uh, uh, a sort of uh, polymeric suspension. So some of the properties are different, like uh, viscosity, like uh, uh, surface tension. However, uh, we engineers uh, uh, tend to think uh, in terms of uh, safety. So since water evaporates faster, uh, what we have been saying is uh, 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 the best uh, that can happen. So saliva would take longer to evaporate. So if we complied to these uh, uh, ideas, still uh, would be not enough. And uh, our message, our message is that uh, with this uh, two meters or six feet rule, still we are not even complying to what happens to, uh, to water. Now, I don't know if uh, I have a few minutes uh, left. Okay, if yes, I can show you some uh, evolution of what we have been doing, which is related to air ventilation. Uh, because uh, uh, as I promised at the beginning, uh, this is something that uh, you can think of uh, in uh, open air, but uh, how things change when you are in enclosed uh, environments. Now, uh, in closed environments, uh, there are uh, many different uh, mechanisms. So uh, now, while uh, I'm speaking, I'm, I'm venting uh, droplets uh, and, uh, uh, well, hopefully not, uh, viruses uh, and uh, contaminants. And so the, there are two ways to mitigate uh, this problem. One is by mixing, because uh, if there are some uh, uh, fans here inside, the air gets mixed, and so from a concentrated uh, point source, you can dilute all the uh, contaminants uh, in, in a bigger volume. And the other way, which is much more uh, uh, efficient, uh, is by displacement ventilation. So you open a window, you open a door, and then you tend to create uh, a stream, a current which uh, brings uh, uh, things away, and uh, usually this is done uh, by mechanical ventilation. So not always you can uh, open and close uh, the doors. Uh, in some cases, it is not uh, uh, energetically efficient because uh, uh, you should control also uh, temperature. So you tend to do it by uh, ventilation. And this is what, what is usually done in offices, in uh, airports, and uh, uh, in other public uh, building. So let's try to uh, to uh, itemize the various uh, mechanism that, uh, mechanisms that, uh, that happen. So if you are sitting uh, in a room, what happens is that uh, you generate uh, uh, a thermal plume because each of us uh, produces about 100 watts of uh, uh, heat and this produces uh, a buoyant plume, okay? Now, if you close uh, and isolate your room, after a while uh, uh, you have a, a warmer environment and after a while you reach a steady state in which the inner temperature is in equilibrium uh, with, the, 
uh, actually the inner production of it is in equilibrium with the uh, with the dispersion outside and you reach an equilibrium temperature and then what you would like to do is to change the air so you force air from inside and then you uh, by mass conservation you must get rid of the of an equivalent volume of air and then you start pushing up uh, a sort of uh, an interface so the idea is that uh, the uh, fluid layer where you are operating is clean and then you push uh, all the contaminated uh, air uh, up, out, uh, up, up. But then uh, another phenomenon uh, uh, comes up because we are breathing and then we are uh, producing uh, also other contaminants, not only heat. And then uh, if you have uh, a stable layer, fresh air below and, uh, uh, and the hot air above, you have a stable interface and contaminants tend to become trapped in this interface. So all the game in this mechanical ventilation is to uh, predict or to uh, dimension or to design things so to have this interface not at the height of humans. You want to have this interface well above your, uh, your height. So this is the, uh, the rule, uh, the main rule of the game. Okay, so once again, since we are very fond of numerical simulations, uh, we said, well, let's see if we can uh, uh, come up with some, uh, uh, with some uh, calculations. And so again, we have By temperature, uh, the interface uh, comes out more because of the temperature or humidity? Uh, both. Actually, there are three factors, humidity, temperature, and CO2 concentration. Uh -huh. Because uh, of These course- These the, the other e two. Each one uh, has a different, uh, uh, a different density. Uh, actually, CO2 has a different density. Temperature, uh, affects density through thermal expansion mm -hmm. and then the humidity of course has a different density now despite uh, our intuition the humid air is lighter than uh, dry air okay just because uh, in uh, in a vapor phase uh, the uh, air molecule is heavier than the water molecules so, just so the displacement the ventilation should dehumidify also well you, you should do several things now uh, yeah. you you will see yeah. Okay, now uh, the control parameter is this uh, uh, ACH, which means uh, the air change per hour. It is some uh, technological uh, parameter. And now uh, you can see uh, this is temperature. So we uh, generate this plume just by our head, which is sort of the uh, processor of our body. So it is the, the one generating more, uh, more heat. And this is the reason why we can sleep with the, uh, a blanket up to here without freezing. But if we have an arm outside, it gets uh, uh, very cold uh, quickly, just because the heat is producing most of the, sorry, the head is producing most of the heat. And then uh, uh, there is also additional heat generated by our breath. Okay, and both sources uh, are uh, accounted for here. And so you can see that by uh, mechanical ventilation with some imposed uh, ACH, you have this uh, interface which drifts down uh, and eventually some uh, uh, steady state uh, is, uh, uh, is reached. And then you can see that also temperature uh, profiles uh, tend to, uh, to become different because uh, uh, higher layers uh, are lighter, and then the temperature tends to, uh, to stratify. And the same for CO2. Now you can see that CO2 is only generated by our uh, breath, of course not by, uh, by our head uh, uh, as a whole, and then this also tends to, uh, to stratify uh, in the upper layer, uh, just because uh, it is very warm. And then uh, this is the trapping mechanism uh, I, I, I mentioned. So you can see that the highest concentration, which is the peak uh, to the right of this graph, is just uh, at the interface where buoyancy also tends to, to jump and temperature tends to jump. And now let's see what happens uh, with stronger ventilation. So, okay, movies uh, are always uh, nice to, uh, to see, to relax a little bit, but the quantitative information of this movie is that uh, the interface now is higher. So by increasing the 
indoor ventilation, we have pushed uh, this interface uh, uh, higher. And in fact, you can see that also temperature is pushed uh, uh, to uh, higher levels. And uh, uh, the interface is indeed pushed uh, above two meters. So uh, a question uh, we might ask, well, this is for uh, CO2, and now uh, this is, uh, even the, the blockage is largely eliminated. However, an interesting question, uh, apart from looking at movies uh, and graphs, uh, is there any indication we can give uh, uh, to uh, people designing uh, indoor ventilation? So we have found out that uh, uh, there are quite some uh, uh, empirical and technical uh, uh, correlations. And one of them uh, is this one. This is uh, uh, by far uh, the, the most uh, uh, popular among uh, uh, indoor uh, uh, thermal control people. And, uh, and this, it has several parameters. So the uh, height of the interface you want to, uh, to reach, the total height of the building, uh, sorry, of the room, number of people, and so on and so forth. And yes. Let's say, but this um, is still uh, based on this simulation of uh, this cube of size it is, it is, three meters. It is, yeah. So let's say, if you change size, then. Uh... Well, if you change size, uh, you don't change uh, the functional law, but you change some coefficients. And, uh, and so we uh, asked ourselves, uh, is there a way we can rationalize uh, these, uh, uh, these numbers? Uh, well, the idea is, uh, uh, first of all, let's see if our numbers fit with this, uh, with this relation. And uh, fortunately, the answer is yes. So these are our uh, simulations, uh, and that is the empirical fit with the appropriate uh, uh, coefficients. And then one is tempted to, uh, to say, well, then I can increase the mechanical ventilation, and then I will keep pushing up uh, the interface. But then you see that this, after a while, saturates. So it seems that there is an optimum of this mechanical ventilation. So if you don't do anything, of course, you saturate your environment. You start ventilating, and the interface starts rising. But you can do any better than a limit, than a threshold. And this is important, because, uh, of course, if you fix this limit, and if you know in advance, you can save a lot of energy. Uh, you can spare resources, uh, which could be used for something different. And now I will make uh, uh, a long story short. So why do we have this uh, uh, saturation? So the saturation actually happens because uh, uh, there is an energy balance. Actually, what happens is that you have uh, three sources of energy of uh, energy sinks. So one uh, is uh, potential energy in the stratification. The other one uh, is uh, mechanical or kinetic energy into the um, mechanical ventilation. And the third is uh, uh, friction losses, either internal friction losses or friction losses with the boundaries, okay? And now if you estimate uh, things, you end up with this uh, uh, sort of balance. So the best you can do is when the two line crosses. So when mechanical energy balances uh, the potential energy. And so the sort of magic number which apparently uh, people uh, uh, did not uh, uh, know is that uh, the optimal uh, uh, mechanical ventilation is uh, 0 0.06 cubic meters per second per person. Of course, uh, this number holds uh, for uh, a cube uh, three meters in diameter, which anyway is sort of the average office uh, uh, that we have available, maybe with slightly different uh, uh, shape. Of course, the simulations could be rerun also for uh, different uh, geometries. And, uh, well, rather than uh, uh, putting written conclusions, I've just uh, put a couple of pictures to uh, fix in your mind uh, that uh, there are two different regimes, buoyancy-dominated and, uh, uh, say, convective or inflow-dominated. And uh, at the transition with the, uh, between the two, there is the optimum ventilation uh, parameters. Uh, with this, uh, I think I will uh, conclude. Thank you for listening, and I hope I triggered your, uh, your curiosity. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Roberto. Uh, we have 
time for questions. And uh, if, uh, if someone from, uh, let's say from, uh, from Zoom uh, wants to ask some questions, I guess uh, he can just uh, unmute himself uh, or herself and, uh, and ask. Or if someone from the audience, uh, the microphone. So, so maybe I can ask a short question. Yes. Roberto. So clearly uh, the numerical uh, computation is impressive. I wonder if it is meaningful here to make use of this uh, multi-scale methods called averaging methods by Vainani Abdul uh, that essentially try to solve uh, the small scales averaging, but then they can proceed with large steps. But clearly if you have a, a very important interest in the phenomena in the small scale, they are not. But if you are interested in just in the okay. in the other scale, then there is this very recent class of methods which is under investigation that I'm curious if may work in this context. Yeah, so, so uh, if I got uh, uh, the question uh, correctly, uh, these multi-scale methods uh, in the engineering field uh, are uh, sort of uh, turbulence modeling. So what, what you could do yeah. is to solve uh, uh, equations for a sort of mean field or uh, a hierarchy of equations uh, depending on the scales and uh, each one you have uh, uh, a different computational effort of course since uh, uh, the Navier-Stokes equations are fully nonlinear and there is a continuum of scales uh, you cannot uh, uh, separate uh, uh, by a hard bound these, uh, these scales now, the problem is that uh, here it is uh, really a complex interplay between large scale, which makes the mechanical steering, small scales, which mean uh, which uh, uh, are, are responsible for mechanical mixing, and the tiniest scales, which are responsible for irreversible diffusion. And uh, yeah. You range from a few meters, which is the length by which uh, a turbulent cough uh, uh, propagates, up to microns, which uh, uh, the droplet uh, uh, evolves. So yeah. separating these scales, uh, I would be a little bit scared because uh, the uh, interplay between uh, these different uh, uh, length scales should be modeled. And uh, as you could see, there are very tiny differences, like the local humidity going from 100 to 110 percent. Usually in the engineering field, whenever you are using turbulent models, you don't expect uh, uh, to, uh, to appreciate these tiny uh, differences. Uh, however, there are, there are some studies already in the literature using uh, uh, turbulence models like RANS or LES, uh, but in this case, uh, you rely so heavily on additional uh, modeling uh, uh, issues uh, that uh, uh, when, whenever you get something new, you are never sure whether it is uh, an artifact of the model or a real physical uh, phenomenon. Yes, I, I was referring to this uh, so-called heterogeneous multi-scale uh, integration by Enquist, uh, Vainani, and Abdul. I think that essentially in this heterogeneous multi-scale, they don't cancel the scale, but they do more or less what you mentioned. So they do averaging on the small scales and on these uh, averages, they can make large steps to the larger scale. So they do a sort of sampling. There is also stochastic analysis inside. There is a, an Acta Numerica paper. Maybe I can address you to this. Yeah, sure. By Vainani, uh, Bion Enquist, who was also our guest, and Asir Abdul. Uh, I would be more than glad uh, than, uh, than reading. Uh, however, this reminds me a lot of the LES approach. In which yeah, probably is related. To average uh, locally. Uh, the yeah, yeah. Case. This is the idea. Yeah, well, and, and then uh, this, this is exactly what I would fear for a problem like this because you should rely so much on, uh, on a model that uh, at the smallest scale, you never know whether what you are seeing uh, is an effect of the model or real flow physics. But I of course, uh, I should also be... Com My impression is that here, the interaction among scales uh, is not at the first order. There are uh, higher order effects. So if you average, uh, 
it's like if you assume that uh, the interaction of averages is enough to describe the interaction. Yeah, okay. uh, while here you have to take, in my opinion, higher order moments. Uh, so the, the, the possibly you can go further in place. Yeah, I think that in the traditional scaling, they moment. do, yeah, Maybe they do another, further. Yeah, at they the moment, do. the truncation uh, yeah. that could uh, play the game. But yeah, yeah. Uh, here uh, we have uh, in a lack of uh, statistics. So you don't have uh, uh, actually a probability distribution function uh, known uh, no, for, for uh, 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 in the lack. So it's a sort of a non-parametric statistics. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, in the lack of the PDF, uh, it's uh, very hard to go on with averages uh, uh, with the mean field theory. So in, 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 because you have to do a sort of a double work to reconstruct empirically an empirical PDF that you don't have. And then to average with that, with the double error that you introduce. So at this point, I, I, me too, I'm very skeptical that yeah, the that, interaction of scales can be managed and in this way. And reconstructing this PDF would imply additional modeling. And then you wouldn't know whether what you are seeing would maybe just for uh, the, the rest of the audience. Uh, the essence of the problem is that you have uh, big scales, which are big vortices which uh, uh, steer, and then you have uh, tiny scales, and these are the smallest vortices. Now, mm -hmm. these uh, smallest scales need the very small time steps. And uh, the problem is that uh, you need to integrate these big uh, uh, flywheels using the time step needed uh, uh, by the tiniest ones. So the suggestion uh, of... Uh, Professor Guglielmi is uh, what happens if you just uh, average these, uh, uh, these uh, small scales and then uh, you replace the dynamics of these small, small scales with their average effect. Now, this could be done uh, for this big uh, uh, vortex to some extent. Uh, there are known models like the Smagoriski dynamic model which uh, performs very well, but there is an additional concern that we are interested in uh, droplets. And the droplets are brought around uh, uh, by these large scales, but uh, their uh, pointwise uh, uh, life or pointwise evolution depends uh, right uh, on what the tiniest vortices uh, do on the droplet itself, okay? And then what if, uh, rather than having the vortices, I had their average? Would still uh, the dynamics be uh, accurate? Uh, of course, uh, it, is, it would be a very interesting uh, uh, research topic because yeah. if this worked, of course, uh, rather than uh, uh, simulating two weeks uh, on thousands uh, of processors, you could simulate a few hours uh, on, a, on a desktop uh, computer. So it would be of tremendous uh, 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 practical interest. But of course, uh, this was our first study and we really wanted to uh, uh, track down the physics uh, to the tiniest uh, details no no yeah i yeah i understand i understand yeah. oh, very interesting to compare with uh, yeah using that as a sort of a re as a sort of a replacement of the monte carlo experiment but yeah, although i should also add that uh, something uh, of course uh, on a different theory uh, but the line I showed of uh, uh, Xie yeah. et al. Uh, 2007 uh, was uh, uh, to, to a very, to a zero order uh, what Professor Guglielmi is uh, suggesting because he said uh, uh, actually uh, this uh, Xie et al. has a, a steady humid jet and then he has propagated droplets into the steady humid jet. And then uh, what he got was, uh, this was Wells, and this was Xie, and uh, our droplets uh, existed uh, all the way uh, through. So uh, nothing here should exist. The difference is that uh, our droplets uh, interact locally and uh, instantaneously with the local humidity and local temperature. And in order to do this, you need to know at the local scale what the turbulent field does, what the scalar field does, what the humidity field does, temperature, and then uh, well, of, of course, if you were lucky, you could also always guess a model uh, uh, that would work properly. But uh, uh, 
you could test it, you could benchmark it uh, only once you have reference data. And uh, another point of concern could be that you can perfectly tune a, a reduced uh, model in some situation, but then what happens when you change, uh, say from uh, outdoor to indoor ventilation uh, problems, then you should tune again the, uh, the model. This is at least uh, the uh, current uh, state of the art uh, of turbulence modeling. There are beautiful models which are perfectly fit for some specific context, but uh, whenever you totally change uh, context, then you should be careful and cross-check. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Jack. I have just a technical curiosity. Since you mentioned often the numerical effort, I was curious about whether it was a GPU or CPU-based parallelization of the Okay, code. so uh, this, uh, this one in particular is uh, a CPU-based uh, uh, parallelization. Uh, we have also a version uh, uh, for this code, uh, uh, GPU-based, uh, uh, which is publicly available, so uh, it can be downloaded. So this uh, uh, GPU parallelization, you can refer to uh, Dr. Francesco Viola, who is uh, uh, the, the expert uh, uh, here, and uh, uh, speaking on, uh, on his behalf, uh, thanks to this uh, GPU parallelization, uh, our simulation for, for the art, so a completely different uh, topic, went down uh, from, uh, say, one week uh, per heartbeat to four hours per heartbeat. And this looks really impressive. However, uh, if you look, uh, if you count the hours, it is the same. So the number of uh, CPU or GPU hours you burn per uh, a given uh, time evolution is, is the same. What changes, which makes an enormous difference, is the work clock time. So the time you have to wait to get uh, the solution. So the difference is that uh, if you uh, run on 4,000 processors, you have uh, 4,000 units uh, doing computations for you. If you run uh, on uh, 200 uh, GPU cards, you have, uh, say, 200,000 units uh, doing calculations uh, for you, because each uh, GPU, graphic processing unit, inside uh, has uh, thousands of uh, uh, arithmetic logic units doing the same operation uh, uh, at the same time. So the, uh, the difficulty and the ability of uh, GPU parallelizing uh, is to uh, interpret and transform uh, your algorithm so that you uh, uh, exploit uh, this uh, uh, single instruction, uh, multiple data uh, possibility. Uh, however, uh, Francesco Viola is uh, uh, the guy uh, to talk to if you are interested in uh, uh, GPU. If uh, you would uh, turn also this code, this one for air breathing into GPU, you would uh, gain a lot of time. Oh yeah, sure. It, it would burn, uh, it would run uh, a single case in two hours. Yeah, uh, however, uh, impressive. Actually, actually, this is not uh, real science, but more uh, accounting. Uh, of course, uh, no one, uh, at least certainly not me, uh, has the money uh, to buy this CPU time, and then uh, you should apply for grants. And then it happens that you have uh, 60 million CPU hours on one computer, and then you should use those hours. Or you can have 200,000 GPU hours uh, on another cluster, and then you use uh, uh, that one. So this is the reason why within uh, uh, my group, uh, we have uh, uh, several codes, not only one, because depending uh, on the computational resources uh, we have available, we can adapt uh, the, uh, the tool, the computational tool. So this is very technical, but very appropriate uh, uh, in this context, of course. Uh, thanks, thanks, Roberto, first of all, for the very inspiring talk, interesting. And I was curious about um, the open question. So how to get data, information about the uh, feature which are more biological, medical. So which one you expect to be most feasible about among the points that you highlighted? I don't know if you can come back to the, to the oh, slide, yeah. maybe. 
and also do you find too easy to communicate this result to other communities? At all. Uh, <laughs> so uh, to my uh, uh, point of view, the, the easiest uh, uh, question to answer is uh, uh, what is the effect uh, of uh, uh, non-Newtonian nature of SALIP? Uh, this is because uh, essentially uh, we would know how to handle this uh, uh, non-Newtonian uh, fluid, and then uh, we would do it uh, by ourselves uh, without uh, asking uh, uh, other communities. And uh, the, the problem is that uh, if you ask uh, a medical doctor uh, when a virus uh, is infectious, uh, you would get uh, different answers depending on, uh, on, uh, on, on who you, you ask. So these are very different communities. Communities. It, it is not like uh, mathematics. If you uh, ask a student the Gauss uh, theorem, uh, well, is that uh, there is no uh, no question uh, for viruses? Uh, it well, uh, if he's well trained, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, for viruses, it is not even clear uh, what is the meaning of uh, uh, living virus. Because uh, after all, it is nothing but uh, a, a, an organic molecule. Uh, a virus, by definition, is not alive. In order to come to life, it has to invade uh, another cell. Uh, so this is really something we uh, couldn't get uh, uh, precise, in, precise enough information to, uh, to derive models. Uh, there are completely different uh, uh, answers on the lifetime of a virus uh, uh, on, on a dry solid surface. Uh, it depends on temperature, it depends on the ultraviolet exposure, it depends on humidity, and even then you don't get single, uh, single answers. Uh, anyway, the idea is to uh, explore and then uh, propose to, uh, to different communities. Uh, so today, for example, I got uh, uh, the idea from uh, uh, Professor Guglielmi about uh, this averaging. If I made uh, uh, the, uh, the same uh, talk to uh, biologists or medical doctors, maybe I would get uh, different questions, maybe several criticisms, but uh, also uh, uh, inspiring uh, comments which could be used for uh, uh, new research. Th this is the way research goes. Uh, I'm curious to know if in the modeling of the droplets, uh, is there any direct coupling uh, in between the droplet? So for sure there is, there is some uh, uh, indirect coupling in the sense that all the droplets have uh, a feedback on the fluid. And so vice versa, the fluid gives a feedback uh, on the droplets. I'm wondering if there is some uh, quiescence uh, model. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, so this is not a four-way coupling. It is two-way coupling. Uh, so in the... Uh, CFD uh, field, uh, uh, two-way coupling means uh, that uh, uh, the motion of the droplets uh, influences the uh, continuum uh, fluid and vice versa. And this is extended to this uh, uh, study also for temperature field and for uh, uh, humidity field. Uh, however, the droplets uh, do not interact among the, themselves. And so they could interact uh, in three ways. One is collision, but uh, here uh, we are assuming a diluted uh, suspension, essentially because uh, uh, we are chopping uh, our uh, inlet distribution to 10 microns. So the number of droplets below 10 microns uh, keep increasing, they become a sort of foggy uh, continuum, yeah. and then we have not modeled. But uh, in addition to collision, there is also coalescence, so two droplets can uh, bump into each other and form a single droplet, or breakup. In, if you put a big droplet in a strain field, uh, you can uh, split it into uh, two droplets. And this is missing. Uh, first, because uh, uh, it is considered a dilute uh, suspension, at least uh, for this range of diameters. And then because uh, it would have implied additional modeling uh, uh, with additional uncertainty. And so we uh, decided to, to stay away of it. But, but you think coalescence can have a role in the, that because 
it, it's somehow interesting because if you have heavy droplets, they get even more heavier and then they can fall uh, in a parabolic uh, fashion. But then if there's more droplets, they can survive longer to evaporation. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I, I'm not a unique answer to this. If you look at the movies, uh, especially those by uh, Emmanuel Villermo, it seems that you don't have much, uh, uh, much of this uh, okay. uh, coalescence. And uh, I would say that uh, this would be even less uh, for, uh, for saliv and mucus, essentially because uh, uh, the surface tension uh, due to the, uh, uh, to, to the polymers uh, could be huge. It, it prevents then, uh, the it is very much unlikely that they uh, would merge. Uh, but any, anyway, we have not even attempted uh, this uh, uh, additional model. Thanks. Any, anyone? Okay, so let's see. I also have a question. Maybe yes. it's, uh, it's a bit naive, I don't know. But in the ventilation uh, problem that you have, so let's say basically you are, you're assuming that you have a constant uh, inlet, let's say in some region and then a constant outlet outflow in, uh, in the upper region. But is there some, uh, let's say, optimal way of choosing the geometry of uh, the ventilation, let's okay. say? Or... This is uh, another completely open, uh, uh, open problem because uh, uh, in order to limit uh, the computational effort, uh, we have assumed that uh, uh, there is one uh, slot of inflow and one slot of outflow. But of course, you could think of uh, uh, staggered uh, uh, venting uh, surfaces. So one they are in one on the opposite corner or multiple, uh, 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 multiple slots, uh, but this would imply additional simulations. This was just a, a first attempt to see, uh, to see what is going on. Uh, well, these are all, uh, open uh, research areas. Uh, these are activities we are uh, uh, trying, we are uh, looking for students wanting to, uh, to commit to, the, uh, to these problems. And, uh, and they could be done at very different levels. So from the very basic uh, uh, fluid mechanics mechanism uh, up to the very applied uh, uh, application problem. Okay. Uh... Any other questions? I don't know if uh, from the from the audience, but I don't see other questions from the chat. So okay, uh, let's thank uh, Roberta again for thank the you. very interesting uh, talk. It was really a pleasure to to listen to this uh, to this uh, science. <laughs> and uh, so next much. we will be in uh, two days actually. Yeah, on Thursday. Exactly. So see you on Thursday. Five o'clock. 5 p.m. Yeah. Ok, bye bye. Bye. Grazie Roberto, a presto. Thanks. Ciao Roberto, a presto, grazie mille. Ciao.